Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Hernandez, and we will be going over power conversion today. This is brought to you by Power and Energy Society. So power conversion, when we speak about it, we'll be talking about how you can power your devices, how you can power your projects, um, the micro scale of devices, as well as the macro scale of how we provide power to our homes and some of the components behind it. So today we'll be speaking about some, some components that you guys might be relatively familiar with, but we will be talking about their applications and kind of the broader picture to be able to explain how something like buck converters and boost converters work. So the first three components that we'll be talking about, which some people may be relatively familiar with, are resistors, capacitors, and relays. So a resistor is typically made out of carbon powder and it resists the flow of current. What happens is it actually impedes current by dissipating energy in the form of heat. And then we have capacitors. So a capacitor is a component with two conducting plates and they are separated by an insulating material. And on those two plates, we collect and store electrons. The next one we have is relays. So relay is an electromagnetic switch that is typically used in a smaller control circuit to control a larger circuit or larger power load. Let's talk about some other applications. So as far as capacitors, capacitors can smooth alternating current to a pulsating direct current. And it can remove voltage dips that may cause components to act non-ideally due to a lack of power. So in this case, what happens is, say you have a, a robot or a machine that you're working on, and you decide to power on or a bunch of peripheral devices or extra devices like sensors and stuff like that, have to power on and work in conjunction. And then what happens is, depending on, on the size of your capacitor or the, the current draw, is the capacitor will store power. And during the time where each, each sensor or component is using its peak power, during that time, its peak voltage, peak uh, current, then what happens is there's going to be a higher power draw, um, which results in, in not all components getting the power that they need. So a capacitor can be used to supply power within lulls of power to ensure that all your components and devices act ideally. So capacitors can also be used as a filter, and it can filter out DC because DC uh, cannot go through a capacitor. Um, so it can filter out DC from an AC signal riding on a DC signal. Uh, so then you have your alternating current and then you have your direct current. And sometimes your alternating current is in maybe like the millivolts, less than 200 millivolts. And then what will happen is the direct current will cause it to displace. So say you have 200 millivolts and then you have a, a DC voltage of five volts. And what will happen is you'll end up having five volts and then the, the AC signal riding on it, 200 millivolts uh, on that five volt DC signal. Uh, so that's kind of what happens, and you can actually filter out the DC from that using the capacitor. Now, the next part we have is resistors. So resistors basically ensure that components receive the proper voltage by creating a voltage drop from one side to the other because they impede the uh, current going through it. And then what happens is they can protect component from voltage spikes. Now let's talk about RC circuits. So RC circuits are a circuit comprised of a resistor and capacitor. They're important because they can reshape the incoming signals of pulses or waves. So if you decide to supply an alternating current as a signal, whether it be a um, like an analog signal, something like that coming in, you can actually reshape this or you can reshape the power that's coming in um, to, be, to be smaller by using integrator circuits, uh, which only passes signals below a certain threshold or even differentiator circuits, which acts as a high pass filter where only signals above a certain threshold can be used. So this is typically used within digital circuits because we have a, a trigger voltage um, that is known to cause our circuit to interpret it as a zero or a one, which is uh, true or false, whichever way you decide to, to notate those. And what we do is we have our, if we look at the first circuit right here, we have a voltage in. So the voltage in is typically your AC signal and we have our resistor and our capacitor. So these are the symbols for them. And then when you measure at these terminals across here, you will see, depending on the frequency that you operate this integrator circuit at when you give it the input pulse, what will happen is you can measure the output and it can act as an integrator to, or basically a low pass filter to only allow signals below a certain threshold or below a certain number, number to actually be seen at this V out. Then we have the differentiator circuit, which is the second one, where we have our voltage in or our signal coming in. And then we have our capacitor and our resistor right here. 
and then we have our voltage out. So this will only allow this will only allow signals above a certain threshold um, to pass through and be be read at this voltage out. So an example is you have your signal in right here, and it has a nice illustration. And only high frequencies are allowed to pass through here. And this is a passive high pass filter or an example of one. Uh, all these circuits you can assemble yourself. The circuit diagrams are on here. I just hope to explain them and give you guys some, some background on them. Now, the next thing we have is relays. So within relays, we have a smaller control circuit, um, which when given power, the relay activates opening, opening slash closing the circuit for the higher voltage circuit. So in this case, what happens is you have coils right here, and right here at these two is where you put your, your smaller circuit. Uh, so when you supply voltage right here, say this is your load uh, for maybe like, let's say there's a higher voltage running through this battery. Maybe like, we'll just give an example of um, 125 volts. Then say this is a 12 volt relay. If you su supply 12 volts on here to trigger the relay to close, then what happens is you then close the circuit for the higher voltage. So basically how this works is it creates a magnetic field right here on this, on this set of coils and it closes the electromagnetic magnetic switch. So these two circuits are not connected. And a prime example of it is say you have an AC signal like something coming through your wall and you pass it through a relay. Now the relay is either open or closed depending on if you provide it a, a trigger voltage. And right now we see that it's, it's open, so that it's not supplying power to the load. And we'll say that the load is maybe a lamp within your room. Then what happens is we have this first circuit, this larger control circuit uh, from your wall outlet to your lamp. There we go. And then from here, we have it connected to a relay. So the relay is just a switch. And there is a set of coils and an inductor right here that causes an electromagnetic field. And when you supply a voltage to it, um, then you can close the switch right here to cause your light within your room to be on, which is, is a good example. Um, a lot of people can use these to, instead of a 12 volt signal right here, they can use a five volt relay, which is a trigger voltage to cause it to close. And they can use a microcontroller to close the switch and indicate when they want the light on and when they want it off. So I hope that kind of sums that up. If you have any questions, you're always more than uh, welcome to email us for some clarification. Uh, some common symbols that you will see for relays are a single pole, single throw, single pole, double throw, double pole, single throw, and double pole, double throw. So the single pole, single throw is basically a switch by itself. Just you, you close the relay and that's it. So here's your, your coils that create the electromagnetic field. When the coils create the electromagnetic field by providing a voltage to them, the relay, it closes the switch right here. So that's an example of this one right here, which is a single pole, single throw. This one, a single pole double throw is one is normally closed and the other is normally open. So if you apply voltage to this, to this uh, coil, it'll create a magnetic field. And from there, it can pull the switch instead of being right here to being right here. So say this is one component and this is another component, then you can decide which component needs a, a certain needs power at a certain time. An example of this is uh, oversimplified, very oversimplified, is your air conditioner. Say on this side, if we connect the circuit like this, it powers your AC, but if we connect it to the other side, it powers your uh, heater, then relays can be used in those situations in which two things don't need to be powered at the same time, and they'll never be powered at the same time, but you can use this to decide which one is powered at a given time. Then we have the double pole single throw, which you apply two voltages here or one depending. And from here, it'll close both circuits or leave them open. Then you have the double pole double throw in which you can give uh, two input voltages, trigger voltages, and it'll decide on each one, which one should be open or closed. And then we have a, a common symbol for the relay as well uh, is all of these. So further talking about components, we have diodes and inductors. So diode is an, a component that only allows current flow in one direction. An example of a diode is also a LED, a light emitting diode. Um, there's a whole class pretty much dedicated to diodes, so I will leave that to them, but we will give you an overview on how you can use them. And then we also have inductors. So inductors are a coiled wire that creates a magnetic field that resists rapid change in current 
output freely passes DC. So what happens in this is inductors do not like when you change the power delivered to them. So because direct current stays constant, or if you have a direct current that is constant, uh, rather than a pulsating one, it'll allow it to pass through freely without any problem at all. But if you try to pass an AC uh, signal through an inductor, it'll choke it out because it does not like the change within um, the positive peaks to the negative peaks. It does not like a change. So that's what will happen with an inductor, and we'll speak more about that later. So diodes. Diodes, so they can take alternating current and impede the flow on the negative waves known as a half wave rectifier or invert the negative portion to cause a full wave rectification. So if you look right here, you'll see our AC signal that we're gonna put through a diode. Then if we use one diode, we will in turn, we will not allow current to flow in the opposite direction for this negative uh, peak. And from there, it'll just flatten out. So in here, we have choked it off so that we can only allow the positive part of the alternating current to pass through. And what happens is you lose power during this time. So we also have a full wave rectification, which I will get to uh, in a little bit because we have these diagrams right here to help explain them. Um, but <clears throat> the applied input voltage, um, which is right here, can be a single phase, which is an example of this, or three phase, how we spoke about within the grid implementation seminars. And the input alternating voltage is converted into a steady, smoother DC output, which we will look at using these diagrams. So in the first case right here, we have one diode. So we give it an AC signal, like maybe something coming through our wall. Please don't try to do this through your wall. You, that is a, a higher power load. And the, the diode you would need to choose would be very specific um, to ensure that you would not damage anything. So you have some input wave, which is our alternating current. And we have our positive and our negative. And from here, the diode causes it so that the current cannot flow in the other direction. So in the case of an alternating current, the current flows in one way when it's positive, and then it tries flowing the other way when it's negative. So it, this diode only allows current to pass this way and does not allow it to go backwards. So that's why you see this rectified output waveform as a half rectification, because there's no negative half cycle. So during this time, you get power. During this time, you have no power. During this time, you have power. During this time, you have no power. Then from there, our AC input voltage. Uh, these are two examples of our full wave rectification. So for full wave rectification, we take an AC input voltage, and we pass it through four diodes, and we cause it to become a pulsating DC output voltage. So it inverts those negative portions to be positive. And then from there, we can actually make this even better by applying a capacitor right here. So remember how we talked about that a capacitor stores power and then lulls of power, it will release that power. Well, what happens is in your full wave rectification in this peak right here, um, I'm sorry, in this, in this lull right here, it will release the power that is stored to cause it to smooth out. So rather than having this blue line right here pulsating, you'll have this, this black line that causes it to become a little smoother. And depending on the capacitor uh, value that you choose, will determine how smooth it'll come out. The next thing we'll be talking about is inductors. So inductors are a coiled wire that creates a magnetic field that resists rapid changes in current, but passes DC current freely. So an example of this is, here's the actual symbol for it. And this is literally just um, a, a wire or, or some wire coiled around an iron core. Um, so an example of it is, is earlier how we saw this. This is the wire wrapped around an iron core, and these as well are iron or some ferrous core. And then from there, what will happen is, in the case that you give it alternating current, the inductor will choke out the alternating current and allow direct current to pass, because it does not like sudden changes within its current. Um, remember how we talked about how alternating current goes forward during, during its positive peak and then backwards within its negative peak? It does not like that sudden change, so it'll choke out the alternating current. Um, this is actually a, a proximity sensor, uh, an induction sensor, um, using, using inductors. So what'll happen is it'll generate a magnetic field. 
And then from there, when a metallic object comes within a certain proximity of it, then it will mess with the eddy currents that are created within this magnetic field, and it will recognize that there is a metallic object or something that can affect its magnetic field close to it. Um, so in this case, that's how we use an inductor for here. And some examples are tuning coils to change the resonant frequency on your, your radio. Uh, it can choke uh, the alternating current uh, while passing a steady signal, which is the direct current. Uh, it is used within transformers, which you'll see a little later, as well as it is used within motors, solenoids, and electromagnetic coils. So let's talk about integrated circuits, because if we're talking about how we transform power to use it within our, our, um, our components, our robots, our, our, our projects, and things like that, then on a smaller scale, we have integrated circuits. So when you're dealing with, with not as high voltages, then you can use integrated circuits. Um, so then what we do is we take these voltage regulators, uh, which are integrated circuits, and basically what these are, are they, they are small wafer chips within a package, and the black part is the package, the actual wafer chip is significantly smaller, um, and it can provide voltage regulation for small loads. Now, in this case, what happens is um, a linear regulator operates by using a voltage controlled current source. So this, this voltage source is, um, is controlled by, by a current source coming into it. Uh, and it uses the principle of feedback and it forces the voltage to appear at the regulator output terminal to be fixed. Um, and basically what it does is at the end, it monitors what the voltage is and it adjusts the current right here to change the voltage uh, across this. So a good example is the LM317, which is depicted right here. And basically what you have is you have some signal coming in that you provide. And then this could be uh, within, this could be direct current, mostly direct current if you're using, um, if you're using like your own portable project and things like that. Then what happens is you supply it with some direct current, uh, you send it in and your output is determined by these two resistors right here. So R1 and R2, the LM317, you'll notice the first pin right here is the furthest. The middle one is your adjustment or your feedback, which is the middle. And then the third is this one right here, uh, which vice versa on, the, on one and two, but not three. So then the, these two resistors right here can determine your range for the voltage regulator uh, to cause your voltage supply to change from 1.2 volts to 57 volts. So it's all about what resistors you put right here to cause the voltage regulation to be set to a specific value. So this is just a common example that, that most people will work with or one of the easiest, most available ones and cheapest uh, out there for, for just small voltage regulation. So what's the point of all of this? Why are you telling me this? So we have two things, a buck converter and a boost converter. So say you give some unregulated uh, direct current like a battery, then you connect it to a buck converter to drop the voltage. And then for the boost converter, you give it some, you know, say a battery, then you give it some, some voltage, some unregulated voltage. And then from there, it'll increase the voltage. And what will happen is you have your load right here. So then this is how you can change the voltage um, to supply power to a load like your devices within your projects. So you'll notice that we have our inductor right here, our diode right here and capacitor right here inductor right here, diode right here, capacitor right here. And we had just spoken about all these components. So you see how we, we kind of took those baby steps and kind of got to this point. Now let's explain the, the principles of them. So within the case of a buck converter, this takes a higher voltage, unregulated voltage. So say you have a 12 volt um, unregulated DC from maybe a battery. Then what happens is, and you want to change it to say five volts right here, instead of the 12 volts that's coming in, then you can do that using a buck converter. And what happens is the buck converter uses a switching transistor and it turns off and on the power supply super, super quick. Um, so then right here is when it's off, right here is when it turns on to allow power to flow, turns off, turns on, turns off, turns on. And what happens is instead of having these peak voltages at 12 volts, it causes it to average out kind of like pulse width modulation. So rather than a 12 volt constant supply by using the battery, you can actually turn this voltage off uh, and switch it to cause a, a averaging of the voltage to be supplied to your load, um, therefore using a 12 volt supply for maybe a five volt component. 
and that way that the component will not be damaged. So now in the case of the boost converter, now let's talk about this. So the boost converter is pretty cool because what happens is with the switching transistor, um, this causes the, the circuit itself right here to open and close uh, super quick and cuts off parts of it. So remember with the inductor, we do not like sudden changes within current. Um, so what happens is when we switch off this uh, unregulated DC voltage, when we switch it off, the inductor gets really mad. And the thing about inductors is if I was to provide a five volt source to an inductor, like a battery, and then I was to take it away, the inductor is storing power within a magnetic field uh, on the coils itself. So even though whenever I give it that voltage of five volts, it's happy, it made a magnetic field, it's good. Then it'll, the output will be five volts. But if I suddenly take that battery away while simultaneously measuring the voltage difference at the ends of the inductor, what will happen is when that magnetic field collapse on the inductor, it'll cause the voltage to shoot up anywhere from 100 to 300 volts. If you use a five volt supply and depending on the actual parameters of the inductor, whenever you take away or cut off power to it, this inductor releases its power in the form of collapsing the magnetic field. And therefore, um, it will try to try to cause that change that you just gave it to not happen. So in this case, what happens is we uh, open the circuit, allow the inductor to create a magnetic field, then we turn it off. And when it turns off, it causes this inductor to it causes this inductor to create a high voltage. So what happens is we first switch it on. The capacitor charges to whatever you have right here. So say it's 12 volts then the capacitor charges using the 12 volt supply. And then what happens is we cut this off and the inductor gets mad and it creates a huge voltage spike, which further charges the capacitor past whatever you had right here. So say this is 12 volts. Whenever you charge the capacitor, it'll be, it'll be charged to based off the 12 volt supply. And then once you cut off the power to the inductor and allow the inductors collapse in the magnetic field, to produce a voltage, that voltage will then charge the capacitor, therefore charging it past its current limit of what the 12 volt unregulated supply could do. So that's what happens is the inductor gets mad and further charges the capacitor. So you first uh, charge the capacitor based off this unregulated supply, whether it be 12 volts, 15 volts, 25, 24, whatever. Then after you, you cut off power to the inductor and open it for the capacitor, what happens is the inductor will now charge the capacitor past what this unregulated supply was able to charge it to. And that's the premise of a boost converter, how you can get a, a lower voltage at this end to become a higher voltage to your load. So now we will talk about transformers. So transformers are used within the macro application on how do we deliver power to our homes. So a transformer is a device that increases or decreases the voltage of alternating current and the current in one coil induces a current in another coil. So right here you have your voltage primary and it is running through one set of coils and right here you have your, your secondary. And what happens is depending on the amount of coils to each other, you can increase or decrease the voltage to it. So the types of transformers we have are isolation one-to-one, -one, then we have step up and step down. The easiest way for me to explain isolation is to first show you step up and step down. So we have a step up right here, which you have your soft iron core, and then you have a set of coils and you run an alternating current source through this. So in this case, we have a one to five ratio for your transformer. So then you input 10 volts and because of the coils right here, when it induces a current, it causes 50 volts to be output right here. Now the trade-off between this is when you, when you produce a higher voltage on one end, you lose current or it drops the current. But the opposite can be said about a step down. So in this case, you have a, a five to one uh, transformer and you have 50 volts coming in and then it induces 10 volts within the secondary coil. And from here, you have a higher voltage and then a lower voltage. So in this case, whenever you drop the voltage, your current will increase right here. But when you increase the voltage right here, you will decrease the current at that given time. So the reason why we use transformers within alternating current um, transfer is because 
whenever we distribute this power to our homes, we actually hike up this power super, super high to prevent power losses. And then when it gets to your home, um, we use a step down transformer to make it safer to use within your house. So leaving the power generation facility, we will use this right here, a step up transformer and send your voltage from whatever it's generated to be in the kilovolts, super, super high. And then when we get close to your house, those little green boxes on the end of your street, or even those cylinders on the power poles, uh, power line poles will bring the voltage down to a safer level. An isolation transformer is typically used in the sense of working on components live. If you have the same exact amount of coils on one side as the other, it will cause uh, the transformer to be an isolation transformer. And in that case, it is a prime way to isolate the, the load, whatever you have right here, from your actual source. Uh, this is typically used whenever people are working on components um, like power lines and stuff like that whenever they're working on them and they're live when they're on. One of the things is, would you much rather be connected to a, a battery that has, I don't know, God knows 250,000 kilovolts, or would you rather be indirectly using that power and be sort of isolated from the actual supply itself? Um, so it's just used as a safety precaution for the isolation transformers is typically what they're used for. And with that, that, that really concludes kind of what we're talking about for today. So what we do in this case is we, what we do in this case is we spoke about the, the micro devices uh, or the micro applications of how to power devices and how to transform AC uh, into usable DC using components. And now we talked about the macro scale of transformers and how do we use them to, to bring power to our houses and how do we use them to make power safer to use within our homes. Um, so that is really the conclusion of this. We just wanted to give you an idea of the components involved, um, maybe give you some background information on uh, buck converters or boost converters that you didn't know before, or just try to provide some, some more solid information for you guys. Because as an organization, as we continue growing, we're gonna try to try to create these things to build you guys up. So whenever we do projects in the future when we're all in person, then we have these videos to come back to. Um, so we are, we are focused on your growth, uh, as far as this, if you want to know any practical applications of this or set up these circuits, uh, please go on and let us know, and we will work on that for a future seminar. But we appreciate you guys listening in. We appreciate you guys who came to the original seminar, and we hope you guys have a wonderful day and uh, keep growing within, within your learning.